Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Salam, wherever you're watching us from. Welcome everybody to MacFest 2023, to a wonderful poetry event uh, with Professor Michael Schmidt. Um, if you have any questions during the event or any thoughts you'd like to share with us, please put them in the chat or in the Q&A portal. We do want to connect with you. Also tell us where you're watching us from. I'm sitting in France at the moment, so bonjour from France. Um, before I hand over to our host, uh, Shahire Sharif, I'd like to thank everybody for your um, generous donations that help us create more of those uh, free events um, for you. Um, please do look on event break because we still have quite a few coming up before we finish uh, this year's festival. And uh, do join our newsletter because uh, we're going to be sending out um, some updates um, and sharing how the this year's festival uh, went on. And also you will stay in touch with us uh, uh, when we share the information about the next year festival. So thank you for your donations. Please uh, send more if you can. We really appreciate everything. And uh, follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and TikTok. And do use our hashtag, spread honey, not hate. So today's host uh, is Shahira Sharif, and she's a prize-winning bilingual writer poet and performance artist. She has published two books in Persian and have uh, and a few short uh, fictions in English. She's written plays, performed solo and group shows and exhibited in, main, uh, in many galleries. She has completed a PhD in pharmacy and she um, and she has the experience of working as a teaching assistant at the University of Manchester for three years. So over to you Shahire. Thank you very much, Katarzyna, for that introduction. It is lovely to be here. And um, can I just say hello to everyone who's watching us? Welcome to this very exciting session. I, for one, am really excited to listen to our speaker about Ghazal. Particularly, the title is intriguing, isn't it? For more ways, out and in. Woo. Let's just see what he's got to say. Um, throughout the session, it would be great if you could use the chat. And um, as Katrizina mentioned, it would be nice if you even write something like where you're listening to us from. Uh, it would uh, tell everyone the spread of our writers and listeners, thank your pardon, and where you're from. So do use the chat. If you've got any question, please uh, write them in the chat. And also I would encourage you to write if you find anything really interesting, uh, anything you didn't know before and um, you have now found out and you are gonna to keep it uh, in your memory, uh, do write it in the chat and share with us. It would be great. Okay, and uh, I would like to welcome our guest the speaker now, Professor Michael Schmidt. We are very lucky uh, to have him with us today. He is a very, very busy man, as uh, and as I'm sure he would tell us, he's at the other end of the world today, but he's taken the time to, to be talking to us, so we are grateful to him for that. Thank you to McFist for organizing this session. Professor Michael Schmidt is a Mexican-born publisher, writer, poet, literary historian, translator, and editor. He's currently a professor of poetry at the University of Manchester. Michael is the founder and editorial director of Carcanet Press, as well as being with PN Review for 50 years. Examples of his work include Lives of the Poets, Lives of the Ancient Poets, the novel, a biography, and Gilgamesh, the life of a poem. It is our honor to have you here with us, Michael. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to you to tell us about poetry and Ghazal, formal ways out and in. There you are. Uh, sorry, you are on mute, uh, Michael. 
That might have been a better idea to leave me on mute, you see. One thing you should ask your listeners to do is to also make any corrections to what I say in chat, because I'm not an expert in the, I say gazal, because I like the word gazal, it sounds like gazelle, it sounds, it sounds like a, a wonderful creature. Um, I was pleased to see in the chat that someone is in Mexico City. I'm in the same time zone as they are. I'm in Oaxaca, which is where my second home is. I'm, my partner is a Oaxacan. Um, and uh, speaking to you from here, it's, uh, the, the gentleman in Mexico City or the lady in Mexico City and I are both probably in Ayunas. You know, we, we may not have had our breakfast yet. I certainly haven't. Um, <laughs> so. Um, when I, I was really, really grateful to, uh, to, to Zero for asking me to, um, to do this session. Um, she's an old friend of mine and a, a really very interesting writer. And uh, uh, to have her remember me was, was, was a kindness in itself. When I proposed the subject um, of the, the Ghazal, I, I was reflecting on how many Ghazals or, or adaptations of Ghazals I have published in my magazine PN Review. The interview has been going for 50 years. And um, over that time, we have published uh, versions of uh, classic Ghazals by Hafiz and so on, but also lots and lots of modern contemporary poets who write Ghazals. Um, uh, and some of them will be familiar to you. People like Mimi Calvati, who's a poet I published from the beginning of her career, uh, writes wonderful Ghazals. Um, of an American poet with whom I've worked for many years, Marilyn Packer has done wonderful translations of Gazals and writes the sequences of them herself. Um, and uh, the, uh, one of our, our a great comic writer and a wonderful crime writer called Sophie Hanna, one of my Condam students, wrote a, a very funny Gazal about, um, uh, about a person on Mars trying to see the sights while his beloved on Earth is trying to send love to him in a Gazal form, and it doesn't travel very well. Um, so there, there are there have been comic guzzles and there have been uh, uh, effect, uh, love guzzles and there have been spiritual guzzles all in English in our pages, and um, it's it's a form that fascinates me though I've never myself tried to write guzzles. Um, it has one and, and I, one of the questions I want to ask and maybe propose an answer to here is some. Um, uh, is why the Guzzle appeals to contemporary Anglophone poets. It, it, it had a great renaissance or naissance in um, Canada, where there were possibly a, a, as many as uh, 20 poets writing Guzzles at one time, uh, about 25 years ago. And I'm sure it's still going there. Um, and it's, it's spread mainly not in the UK, mainly outside the UK, apart from the poets of Iranian and other descents who bring it with them. Uh, like like Mimi, what is it about the form that is attractive, and why do most of the poets who use the form only use parts of it, not the form itself? Um, the poet who absolutely ravished me when I read her late work, uh, Judith Wright, is I think the reason we're having this conversation about Gazals now. In her very last book, she wrote a sequence of uh, of Gazals called. Dwelling. Um, the shadows of sorry, the shadow of fire gazals in her book called Phantom Dwelling. And the Shadow of Fire uh, was really a book in which she tries to come to terms with some of the themes that she's broached in her prose work and themes that she's never been able to broach in her poetry, uh, or never broached them as directly as she wants to, or as non-didactically as she wants to. Um, and the poems are deeply political, but not in the sense that they are polemical. Uh, the same is true, I think, of uh, Marilyn Hacker, who's, who uses a gazel. She does write political poetry, but her, her gazels are not political poems in that sense. There's something uh, very different about the quality of argument as well that she brings, brings into those, those poems. Um, so I thought we, we might just quickly uh, talk a bit about what the Gazal forces the English poet to do, if the English poet retains the rhyme or if the English poet does not retain the rhyme. And I think the Gazal is a wonderful uh, sort of device for, um, for escaping from certain, certain things that Judith Wright herself was very keen to escape from. Um, 
very late in her career, Judith Wright, who was born in the 20s and who uh, who went from the, and she came, was born at the end of the First World War, uh, lived through the Second World War, and went from, as it were, war to poverty, depression, to war, to fatness, as she puts it. Um, the thing she was uh, trying to do in her poetry was gradually to come to terms with the uh, things that Britain, as a colonial power, and as an enabling colonial power, had done to Australia and its native people. Uh, as she wrote, she became more and more fascinated with uh, alternative forms to the English form she was brought up in. For one, for rhyming poet, she writes very beautiful pastoral and descriptive poems, but she also felt, I think, constrained by the traditions of the English pastoral. She was a pastoralist in terms of her antecedents. They all come out to set up farms. One of the one of the farms that they one of the ranches that they had was was as large as most of the English shires would be. So there, there was these huge land grants that they were able to um, exploit. But they were able to exploit them by dispossessing um, the native inhabitants. So as she, as she wrote on, she became more and more sort of fascinated with uh, the horrors um, that had been perpetrated in, in her name, as it were, and the name of her people on the people of Australia and on the landscape. And so she, there's a poem, poem she writes, it's called Notes from the Edge, which has uh, two little quatrains, which uh, I used to love Keats, Blake. Now I try haiku for its honed brevities, its inclusive silences. Issa, Shiki, Husson, Basho, few words and with no rhetoric, enclosed by silence, as if the thrushes call, as is the thrushes call, enclosed by silence, as is the thrushes call. So I think what she was trying to get to with using these Oriental, these uh, these um, Japanese and, and Chinese uh, poets, was to get at something very pared down and something non-instrumental, something which could witness to uh, to what she was trying to see. In an interview, she said. I would like people to read the final series in Phantom Dwelling, which is the Gazals, which were a new form for me, which one reviewer said involve all the elements of rights, world, and concerns. It's a form that allows for both meditation and connection of themes, and I enjoyed writing them. You see, meditation and connection of themes, not argument, not polemic, but meditation, reflection, if you like, and connection. Um, and um, I'm not going to be able to read the whole sequence too. It's a longer sequence. But if any of you would like to see the whole sequence, I'd be very happy to email you the attachment which I've shared here with Steve, and which um, we, we will read one one of them from in due course and, and, and quite shortly. Now, Judith Wright uh, was an active conservationist in the 1960s. Um, and she wrote lots and lots of short texts for public about public issues and about things that were going on. And it was only in the in the mid sixties and early seventies that she began to reflect on her own life and her place in the history of Australia and and its displacements. She wrote a book called The Generations of Men, which was a kind of slightly fictionalized autobiography about her own family. But then, uh, and it was it was reprinted. It's still very much a a, a wonderful. Uh, his family history. But then she wrote a book called The Cry for the Dead. The Cry for the Dead is a prose book. I, I hope it's still in print because it's an astonishing piece of writing. It's soberly written, not overstated, not overly polemical. It's very well documented. And it's an account of the genocide of the Aboriginals in Australia. The story is sometimes almost too painful to read. Um, I certainly found it that way, as are some of the poems, which are exceedingly um, uh, graphic in terms of their recounting of historical incident without, as it were, over rhetoricizing. And the book confirms and makes terribly precise our vague suspicion about what uh, the legacy, uh, the, the techniques and then the legacy of the, um, of the arrangements in Australia were. Uh, what was done was done usually in silence, um, uh, and until extremely recently, historians tended to ignore it. 
It's the dark side of the pastoral invasion of Australia uh, under British authority and largely in the second half of the 19th century. Um, the cultural riches and the poetry of these people, of these Aboriginal people, we know little about, and we probably will find out very little from them. They're, the anthrop anthropologists have, um, have done, done important work in recent years, uh, but a lot has been erased. Um, but her very heavy task in, in her book, The Cry of the Dead, was to trace the catastrophe. Uh, it's been a life's work in a way since, uh, since she began to discover what had happened in 1949 and then worked on from there. Uh, it's one of the best books of its kind that one, one can kind of read. Now, having made these discoveries and understood them, she was at the same time um, writing poems. And she was writing poems which were indebted to the English uh, tradition of pastoral writing. There were poems which celebrated landscape, uh, which celebrated uh, the, as it were, um, the agrarian traditions of both uh, uh, livestock uh, breeding and also uh, farming. Um, and it was only gradually that she found the base of her poetry was horribly, uh, hideously corrupted. Um, so phrases like the phantom dwelling uh, appear and, and her books of poems begin to become more and more uh, tainted, if you like, by the history, de deliberately tainted by the history that she is gradually becoming aware of. It's like, uh, it's as though you have woken up from a relatively <laughs> pleasurable dream into a nightmare and you realize that the nightmare is the reality. Um, so it, it became more and more difficult for her to write the kinds of poem that she had written. Um, the, one of, the, one of the main images that came to obsess her was an image of her own ancestors um, gathering Aboriginals and driving them off a particular cliff, driving them off so they jumped and died. It's called The Leap, and uh, it's a very, very powerful poem. Um, it's the kind of poetry you'd expect from a poet like John Silkin writing about the the uh, massacres of Jews in England during the, the 13th and 14th century. It's that kind of uh, awareness, very strong narrative, uh, not necessarily judgmental, but the judgment is in the clarity with which the facts are recorded. Excuse me, briefly. Um, Her poetry began to dry up. She simply couldn't write it anymore. And I think it's when she began to read Hafiz and when she began to read uh, Eastern poetry, she thought to herself, look, I'm miles and miles and miles from Europe. I'm really quite close in a way to India. I'm quite close to Persia. Why have I not accessed these traditions before? Why have I not made myself familiar with these these literatures, which are as old as, in some cases, older than the literatures upon which I'm drawing, and which have different challenges for me as a writer. Now, my, my guess is that what really excited her about the Ghazal was the way in which the couplet forced certain things on the language. I've chosen my very favorite of the Gazals. This is the one. Um, is it possible to blow it up? Do, do, do you know, Steve? Can we make it bigger? Oh, there we are. Yes. Thank you. Um, he says, um, before, just before writing this particular sequence of poems, he says, uh, Rift, I feel, as existing. This is a rift that led to her um, led to her giving up poetry and starting poetry again with the Gazal. The rift I feel as existing is not so much between the human and natural world, 
then it's much more between European vision and non-European reality. You can call it nature if you like, but Natura was a Roman goddess, and I don't believe in her here in these Antipodean landscapes. Nature here seems to me a mental construct, while for Aborigines, there's no distance involved. Nature, as we think of it, isn't distinguishable from human reality. That is, is a whole. It doesn't have to be given meaning through language because it is the basis of language. So there was an attempt on her part to write poems which uh, in some way brought that strange, very familiar and yet alien landscape up close. And the, the poems, the sequence of of guzzles, which is maybe 20 guzzles in total, some of them uh, quite long, uh, maybe 14 or 15 couplets, some of them quite short, this being the shortest, this one being uh, five couplets. Um, uh, they have certain recurrent themes. One theme is going out into nature in the dark with an electric light seeing the lights that exist in that nature, the fireflies, the, the reflective things that you get from, from starlight and so on, and try, trying to come to terms both with her European assisted vision and with the landscape itself. Um, there's also the, uh, the continual image of drought because the drought, drought began in Australia for her in, her in the 1960s and it continued. As this particular poem is very much about about drought. Um, so, and she died in her late 70s, and this is in my 68th year. In my 68th year, drought stopped the song of the rivers, sent ghosts of wheat fields blowing over the sky. In the swimming hole, the waters dropped so low. I bruise my knees on rocks, which are new acquaintances. The daybreak moon is blurred in a gauze of dust. Long ago, my mother's face looked through a gray motor veil. Fallen leaves on the current scarcely move, but the azure kingfisher flashes upriver still. Poems written in age confuse the years. We all live, said Basho, in a phantom dwelling. Now, just for those of you who are poets and are learning from the Ghazal tradition, the Ghazal tradition, I'd like you to look particularly at this, the third and fourth and fifth, I guess those, those three uh, couplets. There's a full stop in the middle of each one. The first, the first line is separated from the second line by a full stop. There's no logical connection necessarily, um, except maybe in the, in the, in the second of these, the, the, the but suggests a kind of logical connection. Um, between the two halves of the line, they are juxtaposed. The daybreak moon is blurred in a gauze of dust. So you have the moon that shows in daylight, you know, it's still showing in daylight, and there's dust moving over it from, from, the, uh, from the drought. And, this conjures, just briefly, I mean, in a flash, long ago, my mother's face looked through a gray motor veil. So much is happening in those two lines, in terms of memory, uh, in terms of landscape, uh, and in terms of love. And I think uh, it's, it's very powerful. There's a passage in Salan, uh, Paul Salan, the, the, the uh, Romanian poet who, who, who committed suicide was in the prison camps in, uh, during the Second World War, um, where he, the line is simply, my mother's hair was never white. And every time I read that line, I find it very difficult not to, um, not to cry. Um, and I think there's something very um, affecting about the long ago my mother's face looked through a gray motor veil, because it takes us back in time. Those of us who know about old motoring traditions, then you have the last line, poems written in age confuse the years. The age of her mother as a, as a, a young woman now dead, 
Um, poems written in age confuse the years, confuse the past and the present. You confuse the age old and the contemporary. We all live, said Basho, in a phantom dwelling. And this is the kind of the, the dwelling into which we wake, if you like. It seems to me the couplet form forces on the poet, the, this, this, the, the Ghazal couplet form forces on the poet a, a natural division between uh, the, two, the two lines, as it were, that, that coexist. Uh, and this paratexas, this notion of parallel uh, developments rather than uh, logical, continuous narrative developments, is, I think, extremely enabling and extremely relieving, releasing for uh, certain kinds of uh, English poets. I was thinking about this in particular in relation to the 18th century couplet. I think it is, is it Coleridge who speaks of the rhymes in Alexander Pope's couplets as being um, conjunctions disjunctive. There's a conjunction bringing the, the, couplet, the couplet rhyme together, but it's also forcing forcing the language apart. I love the notion of conjunction, disjunct. And I think this in a, in a way uh, describes what the Anglophone poet seems to get from the guzzle. So I, I suppose it's time for me to, uh, to invite back my hostess and, uh, and begin our conversation. Thank you very much for this informative talk. Oh, wow, it's, it's a lot for me to go and learn. Uh, you know, in as you were talking, it's, it was very interesting when you said um, the name of that um, um, writer or poet uh, from, um, was, was, it, was it from Australia who said, uh, I've never read the Eastern type of poetry. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's amazing because we tend to um, stick to a habit we like to, as human, we like to be in um, somewhere that we are familiar with, it, within our comfort zone. And the moment that you step outside, there are so many things that you discover. Uh, I definitely gonna read um, and this this poem that you you described about Abergen, Aber, Abergenet. Oh, I can't say the word. Aborigine. Yeah. <laughs> Native <laughs> Aborigines. Yeah. yeah. Um, it is where poetry crosses uh, history in a way and becomes um, a very source of information. Uh, historically, we've all been um, in a way limited by what uh, historian that they were always um, you know, supported by government or by uh, a big brother figure, if you like. Uh, have told us what has happened in the past. And due to the advances in te of technology, we can now uh, hear about part of the history that uh, we wouldn't have otherwise. So I think a traditionally poem is, um, poetry is a form that people would write about what they see that not necessarily you see uh, well explained in history. So it's very informative, isn't it? It is interesting too that um, I would say most, I would say most of the writers of Gazals are Gazals are women. Most of the writers of contemporary Gazals are women, are and gay people. Um, it's 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 a very uh, radical a radical kind of form where you you you're not as it were constrained by as you were saying you're not constrained by what was there before, um, and. There, you could do a, a, a quite an interesting anthology of guzzles by women, by women writers, um, which have a lot of the qualities of the guzzle that I don't think Judith Wright does have uh, in terms of both using the couplet, but also the spiritual stroke erotic elements, which, which are really quite fascinating. There's a beautiful, really beautiful poem by, by one guzzle writer where she, she she expresses that she's le lesbian and she's in, in love and she's wanting other people. She says, but the only person who I'm in bed with is myself and I don't, you know, I don't like myself. The, the, rhyme, the, rhyme, keep, the, the rhyme word is myself and it, it keeps coming back and it keeps coming back. And it's a really, it's a really sort of uh, ruthless kind of re repeat refrain. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. We've got a question in uh, the chat. 
By the way, thank you very much for using the chat and writing um, your thoughts, where you're coming from, where you're listening to us from. Uh, I've got a question um, saying I'm new to this, but does the structure of Ghazal need the particular language to work with it? Oh, sorry, it's gone up. Or can English work in, can English work with it as effectively too? Uh, that's a hard question for me to answer because, of course, I, I don't know the Ghazals. I've, I've heard recordings of them read. Uh, and the, certainly the, the Persian Ghazal is, is, can be extraordinarily beautiful to hear, um, sung, if you like, is, because I think the Ghazal was originally for, wasn't for musical accompaniment uh, or with musical accompaniment. Um, I think in a way, yeah, in, in Persian poetry, we, it's always been mixed with music, and particularly um, Hafez is a very famous person for writing Ghazal. Uh, his words are um, almost as, as if they've got melody in them. So um, I would say music is, is an important part, but I wouldn't think necessarily you need music for Ghazal. Mm -hmm. Would you? But I, I would have thought possibly in the in the historical traditional Gaza, you do need meet, meter uh, or, or or verbal patterning that looks like meter. Yeah. You know, it, could be, it can be either accidental or syllabic or whatever. And um, I think many of the people who write uh, contemporary Gazals in English uh, use free verse. They may use some syllabic regularity. I know that uh, Marilyn Hacker can be wonderfully inventive with syllabics. And um, but uh, yeah. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, we got more questions in the chat. Um, is that Robert's, um, I don't know how to pronounce the surname, B-L-Y, the three what? line ghazal. Yeah, mm -hmm. that you mentioned. Is that technically a ghazal because it's only three stanzas or three lines? I don't know. I was looking at some of the ghazals I published in Piano Review and they run along in couplets and suddenly there's a three line uh, stanza if you like and then the more couplets and another three line stanza so is it a variation that happens do you know do you know uh, 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 do, does it happen in persian that uh, there are line? we we tend to say technically between five to 14 kind of a stanza <laughs> but um, i i think i've seen a shorter results um and uh, even uh, if the ghazal itself is longer, I think the main message is usually delivered in, in one or two stanzas. Uh, so um, I cannot say that, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> it doesn't have to stick to that, that form. Particularly in new poetry in Iran, we seem to be seeing more ghazal coming slightly deviated from and uh, different rules that stick to uh, to mm -hmm. us also why not why should we just say the message <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that i might disagree with you though i think if you do choose a form mm -hmm. uh, especially choosing a form to elicit new new uh, energies from your own language you can't just elicit you know just play with it and then drop it when you don't want it i mean i feel that, that way very strongly with i love syllabics i i, I find syllabic poetry very exciting and enabling but if you're writing uh your, your nine seven nine seven and you suddenly think well this is a really good line it's gonna have to have 10 syllables then you have you failed <laughs> you have to yeah. do nine seconds all the way through um, yeah there you are that's why you are an expert <laughs> I don't you, an have, expert. you have the expert um saying uh, it so um no, i'm a puritan you see you, you're a much more liberal uh, it's, it was actually interesting when uh, at the beginning you said that you've never wrote a ghazal yourself. Mm. Uh, it's it's a strange. Uh, yes, I, 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 hmm? maybe I will write one. I, I I I don't write very much verse anymore, but I I do like the liberty it gives you from uh, uh, to invent and find things. Maybe I have written ghazals without realizing it. You know, I may look back from my work and say, ah. There's a gazelle. It sneaked up on me. <laughs> That's right. Good. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for all the things that you put in the chat. It's interesting. And uh, let me go back to. I had. Um... Yeah, we've got quite a few comments. 
it looks like we've got uh, people really interested in the gazelles in the mm -hmm. audience. Two lines, uh, three lines. It's amazing, honestly. Uh, there is a comment saying when I read Hafez, I see how different it is uh, depending on the translation, which, which is, I, I think I agree. Um, in general, translating a poem is very difficult. Yes. Do poem uh, translate well, Michael? Uh, it, it depends on the translator and it depends on the disciplines the translator sets for him or herself. There's a wonderful American poet called, uh, called Marianne Moore, who whenever she sets out to translate, um, sets herself some really severe formal constraints. So not only is she translating from a foreign language into English, she's foreignizing English to receive, to receive the language uh, that she's translating. Um, and it, it means that you're, you're, never, um, you're never persuaded that you're reading an English poem, which I think is terribly important when you're doing a translation, that you should always, uh, the reader should always be aware of the fact that it is not an original English poem, that uh, there is a distance uh, that the poet, that the translator is respecting between his, her language and the language of the original. Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful translator called Christopher Middleton who decided in German, as you know, the, language, the word order is very rigidly or the verb at the end of the sentence and so on. And he, he said, well, this is the order in which the sense comes to the German reader. Let's keep the German word order in English. And so he did this. And of course, the poems are almost impossible to read until you read several of them. And then gradually you get acclimatized to the, to the strange distortion of English and you get closer to the, or you get close to the German, as is Goethe translations. Um, he doesn't do it fortunately too long, but he does just long enough to persuade you. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, there is also another question, which I think in a way you responded to that. It says, when is a ghazal not a ghazal? What rule, <laughs> if ignored, makes an attempt to write a ghazal fail as a ghazal? Uh, in a way, you, you, you talked about your opinion on that one. Um, any other questions there, Katrina? Do you see anything? I've just sent you one more. Okay. Uh, okay. I have read Ghazals where one word is repeated at the end of each couplet, and the final run uh, refers to the poet. Is this traditional or contemporary English adaptation? I think, and you must correct me if I'm wrong, that it's traditional. Isn't it the tradition that in a ghazal you give your name as a poet in, in the last rhyme? Is that not correct? Uh, um, it is, as far as I know, yeah. So your signature, as it were, um, which is sort of interesting, like at the bottom corner of a painting, you know, you sign Rembrandt or, or Hafiz or whatever it happens to be. Yes, it is interesting. Um, I guess the ghazal first comes into European. Um, poetry very strongly in the 19th century in, in the German poetry, doesn't it? Because I, I think there was a fascination with the Gassel amongst the, the great German poets, uh, all of whom, you know, the Ostwest Divan and things like that, um, which, um, which affected the Romantics in this country as well. But I, you don't see that many Gassels in Shelley, do you? <laughs> Again. Mm. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh... Well, is continuation of the same question, I think, in a way, if there is a radif but no qafiye in the poem, does it consider, is it considered a ghazal? Again? I think, yeah, it's, I think the issue, I mean, I, I, if, if, I were a, a, if I were a Persian, I would, I would not regard these poems as ghazals. I just, I just don't think... They are, but I would refer them as, I would see them as indebted to the Ghazal. The Ghazal has freed up something for them. Because I do think that the Ghazal is a genuine form. It's a genuine form with genuine traditions. And um, you can break the form, you can, you can extend the form, but you, there are certain things that probably should, especially if you're a Persian speaker, should be preserved uh, if, if it's going to remain a Ghazal. So I would, I would say that, um, 
in, in proposing this subject to talk about, I wanted to really talk about the way in which uh, Arabic poetry or uh, you know, a poetry from, from a, a part of the world that you don't usually think of as affecting English poetry, poetics, actually was having a huge impact on English poetics. Um, and it, it brings into play <laughs> cultural elements, which um, I think are very uh, broadening and, and exciting. Um, I think that the main thing that's missing from a lot of the gospels that we get nowadays is the spiritual um, element, uh, and maybe the erotic element too. Uh, Hmm. Yeah, traditionally it's all about uh, love. In, in, well, I'm not an expert, but from uh, my background, um, you know, we grew up with Ghazal and um, it's usually the, the subject is usually love, which could be uh, human love, loving another human being or, or the love of a person for the divine being. So it could be in a very mystical and religious uh, thing as well. Uh, but um, interestingly enough, in Iran, uh, in early 1900, we, uh, when the revolution uh, started, we had a different revolution then. Uh, constitutional revolution of Iran that happened in um, Mashrute during that time when people wanted to have uh, to give less power to the king because by then the king was all the law. Uh, people wanted uh, a parliament to to limit the power of the king. And during that time, um, a lot of changes happened and Ghazal went through some change as well. So instead of being mostly about love, it became about um, a political view, if you like, talking about the situation. Uh, Farukh Yazdi was a famous um, poem, poet at that time. And um, I've got the, the first stanza of one of his uh, ghazal, which um, I'm going to read now. It says, um, gold, gold rang shod dar o dash az ashk bari ma, chun qeyr khun nabarad abr bahari ma, which means um, the whole field is red because we are crying uh, blood. Even uh, the clouds rain blood. And he's referring to the um, revolution and people being killed at that time. So uh, although traditionally Ghazal is very much about love, uh, it changed and uh, it, it uh, took on a different format in a way to deliver a message. And I think uh, there was a need uh, for people to express their opinion and uh, they went, uh, they moved away slightly from the subject of the what comes in Ghazal, uh, but they still stayed true to the format and the, the liming, which I always refer to as an upside down L, that uh, the end of um, the first bits of the first stanza plus the end of all the other rhyming couplets should be the same kind of thing. So um, they would stay to it. But even with the new uh, Persian poetry, we see uh, a little bit of changing, shifting from the solid um, um, traditional, if you like, uh, format. But is it still very much going the way that it was many years ago, it's still going and people love to read Ghazal in that particular way. So yes, you're right. It's very much about keeping the, the, the format as it is alive. The okay. way you said those two lines was very, a, a, very beautiful, but also you could hear the, you could hear the parallelisms in the lines, the, the balancing of sound. You might know what, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's the poetry in its original um, language, yeah, so, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. Uh, so uh, we've got many questions. Uh, Katrina, so please jump in and, and read the questions, um, Katrina, for us uh, to make sure we go through all the questions. Uh, you... You're silent, Katrina. 
there we are. How does the rhyming pattern of the gazelle compare to that of the common forms of poetry in English? Have we answered that one yet? No, I think that uh, the, I think the main the main issue for the for the gazelle is that it it rhymes, if I'm not mistaken, a b c a. It's usually a. It, it, one of the rhymes remains constant all the way through. Is that right? Shaira? Yeah. And, um, and then one of them varies, but but often very often rhymes with with its its predecessor. So. And um, the, the rhyme scheme in the gospel is extremely strict. And it's unlike the English couplet where you know, there, are, there are repeat rhymes, but they're not the same word. You, know, you don't reiterate the same word. Um, so I think the gospel is, is, is more demanding in the sense that you have to make more variations to hit the rhyme. Um, but it's, it's less sonorous, perhaps, than some of the English rhyming forms. Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the questions says, what is the name of the journal Michael publishes Ghazals in? Is it a, oh. um, car Carponet or is it different? Right. The journal is called PN Review. P PN Review, okay. And um, yeah. it's, uh, we publish a lot of poetry in translation and we, we publish a lot of poetry in English and a lot of essays about uh, about it. And I think there are poets that come again and again in the magazine, like Mimi Khalati, like uh, uh, like some of the others I've mentioned, who whose work explores Persian forms. And, uh, and it's really quite exciting, I think, to develop with them. Okay, I'm just trying to read. I've got another one. Uh, this is a question from Lee. How popular is the gazelle in comparison to other traditional poetic forms? How difficult, do you say? How popular? How popular? I would have thought it's like, I, I would have thought it's extremely popular, wouldn't you thought in Persia and, and, and well, throughout that part of the world where, where it's been taken up. It's like um, like some of the popular Spanish forms, you know, that uh, are often taken up, A, because of music, um, and, and B, because they're very, very familiar, they're part of the common language, you know. Uh, uh, I would imagine, if you were, if you are Persian, that you will know a lot of gospels without ever having tried to memorize them. They, they will have just been fed to you by your mother, by your father, uh, and and spiritual yeah, guides. Yeah. yeah, and also it's it's strange enough because um, back home, I remember as a child, I would meet elderly people who might be illiterate but they could read uh, poetry of Hafiz by heart. Mm -hmm. And it was part of their growing up, you know, the story and the poems, wow. they have learned it from their, their parents without uh, ever being able to read, if you like. So that's part of it. And also I think because of the subject is mostly about love and longing. Uh, so quite a lot of people like to, uh, you know, read the poetry to each other, to the person that you love, uh, or uh, you would love to receive that sort of poetry written to you. So um, particularly Hafez, um, mm -hmm. his books are, are very, very common, and um, people tend to use that as gifts to each other. So is um, I would say, yeah, it's very, um, very common amongst us to, to, to have that that ghazal um and any other i've questions? got one more question here how do you categorize the pablo nevada or goethe divan poems uh it's, it's i don't know how to categorize them i i mean i i'm obviously familiar with them um it was part of the orientalist um emphasis in the 19th century wasn't it when when german writers were looking East and we're looking to the great uh, Eastern sages as a way of, I suppose, um, broadening broadening out their culture away from from just Europe. I, I, but I, yes, um, I, I, I again, I, I should have done my homework on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Not to worry. Uh, and can you recommend a Hafiz translation in English? Very difficult. Let's see what you've got. Uh, I can. Um, I, 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 there is a, when I was in Shiraz, I bought a collection of Hafiz in English translation, and the translations are terrible, um, but mm -hmm. I still, I value the book very much. 
um, because of the, the association. Um, it, it may well be that he hasn't yet found his his uh, Fitzgerald. You know, the the uh, Rubaiyat in yeah. translated by Fitzgerald is so astonishingly powerful in English that people often forget that it's, it wasn't written in English in the first place. Um, Hafiz hasn't yet found his his Edward Fitzgerald. Mm. Maybe that's, that's a job for you, Shane. As you see, if now you're being multi, multifaceted, you should become the translator of Hafiz. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am terrible with translation. It is really, really difficult. Um, when you play with words, uh, if you want to translate from any language to any language, it's, it's, it's really tough. You got to be mm. not, not just the translator, but you got to be a poet in that language that you want to translate to. So it's always, I, I would not dare to, to attempt that. There was a question um, uh, about who's the name of the author who wrote, wrote about the red lane. I've written it in the, in the chat, Farrokhi Yazdi. And not that I mentioned his name, uh, just to say a little bit about him. Um, he was very powerful in terms of what, what he would write and he would always be in trouble for what he's written. Uh, he was in prison as a political prisoner for quite a while. He was in exile. And um, uh, when he was in prison, he was killed. Uh, well, um, and uh, they say at some stage they actually sewed his lips together so he cannot uh, say any poetry at, at some stage. So his image is very much referred to as uh, an image for resistance for, uh, you know, uh, people everywhere who wants to 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 say no, basically, to to whatever. So this is the power of poetry for you, I think. Uh, it's interesting um, how it, it has changed depending on, you know, the time that we live in. So it 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 it, it is uh, it's changing as well with the time. So yeah. There was a translator who pretended to be Hafiz. Say that again. Say that again. Somebody, I say somebody has put an, a note in 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 the. Um, in the in the chat saying uh -huh. are, are you aware that Daniel Ladinsky renditions of Hafiz is are not by Hafiz at all? Um, how is it possible that he was allowed to publish a poem and say on the cover that it's Hafiz? Very interesting. It's not kind of, of uh, taking somebody's taking a famous identity and uh, pretending that you are that person. It's like you know, I'll pretend my next collection is by Philip Bark and we'll see what happens. You know? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, uh, we are getting towards the end of the session. Uh, if there are any more questions, please put them in the chat. Otherwise, we um, get ready to say goodbye. And uh, as we are getting towards the end, I just want to read one stanza from Hafez. We talked about Hafez so much. <laughs> so uh, with your permission, I would read this. از شب ظلمت و بیابان به کجا توان رسیدن مگر آن که شمع رویت به رحم چراغ دارد which means um, this night is very dark and I'm in the middle of a desert how could I get anywhere if it wasn't because of the light of your being with me making my path um, light basically so whoever that person is who, who was giving light to Hafez. So I hope your path is getting the same light <laughs> um, wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining us from all over the world, from USA, Canada, Scotland, uh, Mexico City, Dorset, Northwest, Stockport, Manchester, France, and everywhere else. Thank you very much, Michael, for this very informative talk. Really grateful to you. So I'm just going to say goodbye. If there is any final word, we hear from you. Otherwise, we uh, hand over to Katrizina. Thank, you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. That was amazing. Um, it was fascinating and thank you so much to our wonderful audience for uh, participating for all your 
uh, really in-depth questions. Uh, thank you, Shakira, for a uh, fantastic hosting today. Um, it was a pleasure, honestly. Um, and thank you to Steve in the background and to um, Kezra Shiraz, uh, the founder of MacFest. And uh, yeah, if you're free this Sunday, please join us uh, on our next uh, online event, um, Kindness and Integrity. Uh, leadership in a troubled world. Uh, it's going to be another fantastic event. So thank you very much and see you soon.